statistics, sampling. Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. And sampling is a first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Core concept, we need to be able to understand and apply in order to do statistics properly. So what is sampling? Sampling is the process of selecting a subset called a sample from a larger group called the population to make statistical inferences about the population. Let's break that down in a bit more detail. We have the population. That's going to be the larger group from which we are taking the sample, often represented with a large N when we start to do our calculations. We're then going to be taking a sample, which again is a subset of that larger population, often because we don't have the time or resources or possibly the ability to run a test on the entire population. Therefore, our strategy take a sample of that population often being represented in our numerical calculations with the letter small n. And then we wanna make statistical inferences based on the sample. In other words, we're gonna take the sample, run tests on the sample. Notice this is going to be an inference type of situation, meaning we're taking the smaller sample and applying what we learned from the sample to the larger group, which means that we can never have absolute certainty and an inference type of situation because we're not taking a larger group and breaking it down and deducting it to its smaller components that we can understand from the larger group, but instead taking the smaller group, the sample, and hoping that we can apply what we've learned from that sample to the characteristics of a larger group, which inherently is going to have some uncertainty along with it. What we'd like to be able to do is try to measure not only what we think the inference is telling us in general, but also possibly the level of uncertainty we have when making that inference. So the population, the complete set of items or individuals of interest. So when we think about a population, oftentimes we're thinking about people as the population, but the population could be anything that we are studying. We might be studying the, the length of moles or something like that, or something that's not even a, a living thing. We might be just measuring how, how long a widget is when we produce widgets or how many uh, items of widgets are going to be in the box when we produce a box of widgets on average as they're being machine produced. An example, all registered voters in a country. That's probably the first example that comes up to most people when we think about statistic and statistical inference, because at least in the United States, we've dealt with elections all the time. It's always a big deal to say, what do the polls say and what is the actual results? Now, it's also a great example as well because the polls have changed over over the years in terms of the people that they're able to take into the polls, which have added a lot of complexity in terms of the accuracy of the polls, which we will talk more about shortly. Sample, a smaller group selected from the population. So an example of the sample, a group of 1,000 voters surveyed from the population. Again, usually the people is a great example for us to think about this and voting is a great example, meaning we can't test every item or every person in the country to think about who they're going to vote for. But we can take a sample and hope that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population. But you can apply the same concept to many different things, many different scientific endeavors. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to do an equivalent 
idea of taking like something into a lab, removing all of the different components and testing one item at a time to see the results. That's kind of like what we're doing from a statistical standpoint here. We could be measuring, for example, again, how many widgets does a machine make on average? The machine is gonna be producing more or less widgets that they might put into a bag of widgets, for example, and it's gonna have most likely a middle point and then some kind of error around that middle point, which again, we can basically test thinking about all the bags as the population and then run some type of sampling test uh, and see if we can apply those results to the average of what the widget maker makes all the time. Parameter, a numerical characteristic of a population. It's usually unknown. For example, the true mean income of all voters. Statistic, a numerical characteristic of a sample used to estimate the population parameter. An example, the mean or average income calculated from the sample of voters. Now, the key term we want to be keeping in mind whenever we're looking at a sample is the randomness of the sample. Whatever kind of sampling method we will use, typically there will always be some kind of randomness within it. If there's not any randomness within it, we're going to have a suspicion that there might be bias that's being input into the test that is being made. So random sampling, what is it? Every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. Now note, when we think about the idea or concept of random sample, that makes sense. If you, if you put all of the numbers into a hat and you shuffle them up very well, then all of the numbers in theory have an equal chance of being drawn. If we do a random number generation in Excel, all random numbers have an equal chance of being drawn. If we shuffle a deck of cards quite well and randomly select a deck of cards, all of the numbers in the deck of cards or types of cards have an equal chance. However, in reality, that's not always possible, which is easiest to apply to say a voting type of situation when we're trying to take a survey of all of the people and what their voting habits will be because you run into the problem of how in the world am I gonna randomly get information from all of the potential voters because you're not gonna be able to access all the potential voters. You have limitations on how you can contact them. Do I contact them by phone or email? What about the people that don't respond? So notice in theory, this is what we want. In practice, it's not practical that it's gonna be perfectly applicable, which of course you can see will lead to problems, sometimes more problematic in some types of things than others. If I'm testing, say, how many widgets are going to be produced by the machine and put in a bag of widgets, then, then I can do somewhat of a random kind of sample running the sample of widgets or taking a random bag of samples. I don't, might not have as many limitations. I can't look at the bags that have already been distributed, but I can run you know random samples with it. Again, with a population of people, I can't contact every person. Okay. So sample random, uh, simple random sampling, sometimes called uh, SRS, every possible sample of a given size has the same chance of being selected. So complete randomness. Example, randomly picking names from a hat. It's as random as it can be, as long as you shuffle that hat up and pick the numbers out randomly. Stratified random sampling. So this still has a component of randomness, but now we have this concept of stratified random. The population is divided into subgroups, strata, based on characteristics, things like age, income, and so on and so forth. You can see why this might be useful for different types of analysis where we're trying to get information based on the different strata. And random samples are taken from each subgroup. So you can almost think of this as though you're doing multiple different random samples, right? You're basically saying, here's the entire population. I'm going to break them up into these different groups, age, income, and so on and so forth, which are the strata if you think about it as one test and get, get the numbers from each of those strata. Or you might think of it as separate random samples where the population includes people of a certain age or of a certain income and then you're taking random samples of the people that are in that subset of the population, right? So example, dividing a population by age, group, and sampling from each group. 
So cluster sampling, the population is divided into clusters, usually based on ge geography or another natural division, and entire clusters are randomly selected. Example, sampling whole cities instead of individual voters. So if we're looking at the poll example, you're trying to see who people are going to vote for, like in a presidential election, for example, in the United States then you're going to want to most likely also sample people, not just in terms of the entire country, but by geographic location. And you can break things out to a geographic location. Similar kind of strategies might be used in other areas as well. If you're doing tests about animals or about what kind of rocks are in certain areas or something like that, again, you're probably going to look at the, those characteristics from different locations, right? How much of minerals are in the rocks in this area versus another part of the world, for example. Uh, systematic sampling, every nth number of the population is selected from a random start. Example, uh, surveying every 10th person in a list of registered voters. So this might be a way that you kind of choose a type of randomness. So in other words, if you were to take all of the voters and put them in a hat, and then just randomly select from the hat, all of the individuals have an equal chance. But maybe you have some kind of format to choose some form of randomness. You have a list of names and you say, I'm gonna pick a random point in that list of names like the phone book or something like that, and then choose every 10th person within the phone book. Now, obviously, if you didn't go through the entire phone book, that would be kind of a problem because the phone book is in alphabetical order and you'd have a sampling that would only have certain letters in it or something. But if you go through the entire phone book, then that's kind of a random sample, although all of the people were not equally likely to be selected. All of the different combinations were not equally likely. But you would think that for the purposes of the test, it would be random enough generally. So you might have a, some kind of system for random number generation of that nature. That system might not be as necessary these days because if you can put that list of data into an Excel program or some kind of computer database, then you can draw random numbers from it without having to use like a system like that, which might have been easier before you can randomly sort numbers. All right, non-random sampling. Not all members have a chance to be selected. This can introduce bias. So remember, random sampling is the key. Uh, with non-random sampling, we get suspicious that maybe that card wasn't selected randomly because there's non-randomness is being introduced into the equation. So notice that very smart people, when they do when they do uh, hypothesis testing, might might on accident uh, basically bias the sampling by their own actions, right? And that's going to taint you know the sampling because they have an idea of what they think the results could be, right? So that's mean, that means that it could be difficult when you're doing surveys to make sure that you do the survey properly with complete randomness, you know, in the survey uh, so, that, so, that we can, so that we can test it based on statistics. So convincing sampling, selecting individuals uh, that are easiest to reach. So one problem, and you can see this clearly with the voting example, is that if you're if you're in a voting situation you can't reach everybody in the country how are you going to reach people it used to be that you would call people but now not everybody has a a landline most people don't they have they have the cell phones so even that's going to be difficult uh to get to them if you wanted to do door to door that would be difficult to get to as well and you can only talk to people that actually want to talk to you and all of those things are going to bias the sample because the fact that you can't get a hold of them or they won't talk to you doesn't mean they're not going to vote, right? So example, surveying only people at a local mall. So then uh, judgment sampling. The researcher uses their judgment to select the individuals. So example, choosing expert opinions in a certain field. So this is an area where you can think that might be, you know, something reasonable, right? If you're trying to say, I want to know about this technical situation, you know, what, what, what about plate tectonics or something, uh, then obviously if you get the opinion of random people talking about plate tectonics, most people aren't going to know what you're talking about. So what you're going to want to do is get the experts in plate tectonics 
and then try to get some kind of randomness in the sample of the people possibly that actually know what they're talking about in that area. So quota sampling, sampling a specific quota based on certain characteristics similar to stratified sampling, but uh, not random. So example, ensuring a survey includes 50% men, 50% women, but without random selection. So you might say that I'm trying to get a sample involved, but you can imagine a situation that if you took a complete random sample, you might just by randomness alone get some kind of bias because there's going to be a difference between men and women, which might lead you more to a stratified kind of idea of sampling only men and then women and getting the opinions of both separately, possibly. Or you might say, I would like to get an even between the men and women in my sampling test. All right, sample size. Larger samples generally provide more accurate estimates of uh, population parameters. However, after a certain point, increase in the sample side yields diminishing returns in terms of accuracy. So this might seem counterintuitive at first because the idea would be like, if I'm taking a sample of the entire United States, for example, on who they're going to vote for, if I can randomly get more people in the survey, then you would think that would be better for my statistical sampling test. And it is typically, however, like you end up with that diminishing returns. And the analogy here is something similar to like, if you're, if you're making soup and you have a can of soup and you pour the soup in the can and you want to see if it's salty enough, you could take a teaspoon of the soup as long as it's stirred up properly, which is a random kind of sampling or a mixture of the soup. And then you, and then you sample it and see if it's salty or not. If you had a entire tub of soup that's going to be feeding an entire, you know, castle or something, and you're and you're going to be tasting it, you, it's not like you have to drink a whole gallon of soup. You still just want to make sure it's properly stirred up, and then you can sample the same teaspoon of soup basically and see whether there's enough salt in it or not. You kind of have a similar situation with the sampling statistics in that. A larger sample is going to be better because it's going to be more representative of the larger population. But once you get past a certain point, you have enough of the sample to see how much salt is in it or to see whatever the sampling characteristic that you're looking at is there for the most part. So you end up with this diminishing returns. It's not like the bigger the sample, you're going to get an equivalent return on the, the increased sample size once you get past a small uh, a, a particular point a couple things to keep in mind when we think about this concept uh there there's a couple things that are kicking in with regards to the sample one is going to be uh, a, a larger sample size is going to be more representative so that would be good the others we're going to be dealing with a central limit theorem type of concept meaning that even if the data that we're looking at is not normally distributed we're going to be wanting to conceptualize the data so that we're imagining we take all possible combinations of uh, the mean of all possible combinations of whatever sample size. And if we do that, even if the sample is not uh, evenly distributed, the mean of all possible combinations of samples would be, and we can still use that bell-shaped curve characteristic, which is another reason larger sample sizes are going to be better up to a point because that will allow the central limit theorem kind of to kick in. But again, after that point, you get to uh, the diminishing returns. Okay, bias. Sampling bias occurs when some members of the population are more likely to be included in the sample than others. So clearly, this is going to be a problem sometimes just technically. When you're trying to take a sample, you're going to end up with more people of a particular group. There's a lot of examples of this in different type of sampling that has happened in the past where the people doing the sampling were kind of embarrassed, right? Because they took a sample which was completely wrong. And it's like, what happened? And what happened is they had a biased sample of some kind because of the way they structured the sample. So this can lead to inaccurate estimates and flawed in, uh, conclusion. Example, survey includes city residents about agricultural issues will introduce bias against rural opinions. So you can imagine if you're taking a survey and it's easier for you to get the opinion or feedback from people in a particular area, such as in a city location, 
And this is also the case with any kind of poll that people typically take with their own customer base. So if you're if you like have a, a following on a social media platform and you take a poll, well then the poll is representative of the people that are on your in or in your subset population that that listen to you but those people are probably going to have certain characteristics that might be different than the larger population right and so so and that's going to be a critical problem because sometimes if you're trying to do polls and like election polls it's easier to contact certain people than other people it might be easier to contact to some people in the city maybe more well-off people maybe that people that have the landline or are willing to to respond and you might not have as much access to the people maybe the people in rural areas don't really care to talk to you or something like that they're going to vote but they're not going to talk to you well that's going to bias your poll right so variability sample statistics will vary from one sample to another even if the samples are drawn from uh the same population so clearly it's a sample it's an estimate so that means that uh you're going to get if you took multiple samples and ran the test multiple times, you're gonna come up with slightly different results because of the sampling. What we would like to do is design the sample so that we have some parameters around the, the, uh, the amount of accuracy that we have. And that's where the central limit theorem can help and kick in to give us some parameters that give us not only what we think the middle point of the sample is, the mean or average, but also some idea of the amount of accuracy we might be able to, to draw from that poll. And Excel will do a bunch of examples that will actually allow the worksheet to repopulate in another course or section. We'll take a look at that in Excel, which is really neat because then you can kind of run, you can keep on clicking on the worksheet and it will run a different example or a different set of numbers and we'll be able to see the variance of the numbers as they change. So this variability is known as sampling error, meaning if we take the result of the sample and compare it to the population itself, the actual mean, which oftentimes we don't know in practice, but when we do our example problems, there is a theoretical actual number that we're trying to get to, the real amount in the population. We do the test and then if we can compare the test to the population mean, uh, the difference is going to be that uh, sampling error. Now, when we're testing this, it's really nice for us to first test where we know the actual population. We have all of the numbers in the population. Then we run the test, run the sample, and see how close the results from the sample are to the actual population. Once we have those concepts down, then we can look at the situations and apply the same concepts when we don't know about the entire population, which is often the point, and we're trying to run the sample given what we've learned to get an inference and some degree of accuracy concepts about the population based on the sample. So larger samples tend to have smaller uh, sampling errors. So same kind of concept. A bigger sample is typically better, but again, you have those kind of diminishing return situations. Representative samples, right? Uh, a sample should represent the characteristics of the population as closely as possible to ensure a valid conclusion. So if you're sampling horses and you got a bull in the sample, might affect the conclusions about what you're trying to determine about the sample of the horses. Example, a survey about voting intentions ensuring the sample reflects the demographics uh, diversity of the entire voting population. All right, let's say we want to study the average income of people in a city. Surveying every individual would be costly and time consuming, so we'll use sampling. So we're looking at a city, we want to have the average income of the city. We can't test everyone in the city because we probably can't talk to anyone. It would be logistically impossible and impractical and even if we could, we wouldn't have the time to do it. Therefore, we have to take a sample. Step number one, define the population, e.g. all working adults in the city. That's who we want. We have to make that specific. That's going to be the defined individuals we're looking for. Step two, decide a sampling method, e.g. stratified random sampling based on income brackets. Step three, select a sample, e.g. 500 individuals, 500 somewhat randomly selected a num I mean, the, the sample size could be larger or smaller, right? The question is, what would be a reasonable 
sample size uh, to, to be picking that would be representative and so on. Step four, collect data from the sample, e.g. survey income, take the survey, do the actual work. Step five, analyze the sample data to estimate the population parameter, e.g. calculate the average income. So advantages of sampling. Cost, so why would we do the sampling? Obviously, it's gonna be cost efficient. So because sampling is less expensive, time consuming than collecting data from an entire population. So clearly, even if we were able to do it, we're, <laughs> it would be too expensive for us to actually test the entire population for large populations most of the time. We have faster results because of course sample studies can be completed faster, allowing researchers to draw conclusions quickly, which is gonna be something that's important. We can't spend the entire next 20, 10 years trying to survey everything, right? We have to, time is a consideration, especially when you're dealing with the large numbers. Practical feasibility, in many cases, it's impractical or impossible to study the entire population. So clearly this is a limitation with like the voting and for most anything that has a large number of items for trying to calculate the number of different kind of uh, elements that are in a rock or something like that. We can't test every rock that is, <laughs> you know, in, in the world. We have to take a sample and do some kind of sample statistics and see if we can apply that to the rest of the mountain that we're basically testing from or something. Manageable data. Sampling reduces the amount of data to process, making analysis more manageable. So even with computers, the, the number of things that we can sample, even like the human body, like this, it's gonna be, the numbers are massive. There's no way that we could really sample many different things, even if we had all the data, because just the processing of that amount of data would be uh, too much. <laughs> so limitations of sampling. So what are the problems with sampling? Well, of course, sampling error. There will always be some difference between the sample statistic and the true population parameter. So we're not gonna be, we're not gonna imagine that the sample is perfect. Not only that, we're gonna try to say, I know the sample isn't perfect. I know there's some kind of sampling error and I'd like to see, get a number for what that sampling error is or what's the statistical likelihood of how far off the sample is gonna be and the bell curve gives us some capacity to make those kind of calculations. Bias risk, non-random sampling can lead to a bias reducing the accuracy of conclusions. So obviously anything that, anytime a, a sample or study is conducted that is non-random or even when they claim it's random, but you can clearly see limitations like someone just surveyed their followers on a social media page and tried to say that their sample is reflective of the entire population. It's like, well, no, th th there, might be, there might be value to what you have done here. It gives you an, an idea about the people that listen to you, <laughs> but it's not, it's not like you've, you have, have information about the entire population uh, because it, was, it wasn't a randomly generated sample. You're not having an equal likelihood to talk to anyone nowhere close in equal likelihood. And these kind of problems are, of course, in many surveys. So people just do a somewhat pseudo-scientific survey all the time and present data. And if, you, if, if you're not aware or you don't look at it more closely, you can be completely misled by, by just people having improper sampling methods in terms of randomness of, of the sample. And it's kind of fun to, to just, once you realize that, to poke holes in a lot of sampling, which a lot of people like to do. And it seems like a me people call you a, a big meanie for doing that. You're a, you're, a, you're a bully online for putting down people's, but you have to do that. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you're just gonna, people are just giving samples out there that are, that are like uh, not based on, and they're lying, right? You have to call out the line. So anyway, gener generali generalizability. So if a sample is not representative, the findings may not uh, generalize to the entire population. That's the problem. And again, if people are saying, this is the sample, which I'm then making an inference type of 
idea to apply the findings from the sample to a larger population, but the sample you took is, is representative of a smaller subset of the population, not the larger population. Again, either you are mistaken in presenting an, an error or you're lying about the data, which unfortunately, again, happens. And so we ha you have to have people that are going to say that. <laughs> They're going to say, no, that, that's not right, right? You have, you have to say that.